Good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's webinar on climate change adaptation in the mining sector and the growing importance of ESG management to the broader stakeholder community. My name is Manuela Batello, and I'm the National Mining Industry Leader for Marsh Canada. Today's webinar will be approximately 75 minutes. The discussion will run for approximately 55 to 60 minutes, followed by 15 to 20 minutes at the end of the discussion for Q&A. We encourage you to ask questions throughout this presentation. You can do so by clicking on the Q&A icon on the bottom part of your screen or the panel to your right. Simply type your question in the open area. We will endeavor to answer any questions submitted during the registration process, along with those submitted during the presentation. Please note, all participants are in listen-only mode as all lines have been placed on mute. This session is being recorded and the recording will be distributed and available following the discussion. Before we begin, a heartfelt thank you to all the frontline workers everywhere who continuously and tirelessly provide essential services and goods during these extraordinary times. Thank you for your dedication and perseverance. Joining me today are Maya Becker, Director of Corporate Governance and Responsible Investment with RBC Global Asset Management, Sean Capstick, Principal at Golder, Charles Dumarek, Vice President, Science and Environmental Management with the Mining Association of Canada, and Daniel Greenspan, Senior Analyst with CIBC Asset Management. Well before the outbreak of COVID-19, society's concern for climate change impacts were rising. Natural catastrophes linked to climate change have been increasing in frequency and severity, and shifts in weather patterns causing droughts, extreme heat and flooding have added to economic stressors in certain regions. Some have even attributed increases in population migrations to climatic impacts. The pandemic may have caused us to pause on the topic, particularly in the early months of the outbreak. The pendulum, however, has not swung back. A number of institutional investors have even recently affirmed their concern for corporate management of environmental social and governance or ESG factors. Governments and communities, particularly if already affected by economic stressors, are expected to be even more vocal with respect to any industrial activity that does not demonstrate sound ESG management. The Mining Association of Canada and Golder have collaborated to develop a risk-based climate change adaptation guide that will be published later this year. Today, the co-authors will give us a high-level preview of this guide that looks beyond site-specific considerations to promote a broader stakeholder view. A key stakeholder group for corporates is, of course, the investment community. We will hear from CIBC Asset Management and RBC Global Asset Management, two major representatives of that group, their perspective on the importance of climate change adaptation and ESG more broadly in their decision-making process. Let's start with the guide. Charles and Sean, what prompted the development of the guide? Was the Canadian government's plan to include climate change in its assessment of natural resource projects under federal review one of the considerations? Or more generally, adapting to a trend and anticipating its trajectory? And what is the hoped for outcome of the guide's implementation? If I could start with Charles, please. Thanks, Manuela, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, I think to answer that question, I mean, I, the, the short answer, I think it's the latter, not the former, that it's more anticipating trends and recognizing a trajectory and a need within the industry. Um, but I think it's helpful to provide a bit of background on some of the work that Mac has been doing around ESG, because going right back into the mid 2000s, uh, we've had a sustainability pro program for our members known as Towards Sustainable Mining or TSM. And what this program does is it, it provides measurable performance protocols in several different areas around ESG, um, indigenous community relationships, health and safety, crisis and crisis management communications, uh, prevention of child and forced labor, tailings management, biodiversity, um, water stewardship, and finally energy use and GHG emissions management, which is the one that kind of touches most closely on this. But right since the inception of TSM, 
um, Mac has worked closely with an independent multi-stakeholder group that we refer to as the Community of Interest Advisory Panel. And that group um, provides advice to Mac, has all through the process on the design, the implementation of TSM, and also raises some emerging issues of concern that are beyond the scope of those that are covered by TSM. And um, several years ago, uh, they released a, a set of recommendations to Mac uh, on climate change adaptations. And that was actually one of the catalysts um, for launching this program. More broadly, certainly there's a recognition from Mac's perspective and from the industry perspective that there was a gap in this area in terms of guidance, both nationally and internationally. Um, and certainly also recognizing that the increase in concern from both industry regulators, investors, insurers, and others. So a lot of uh, convergent factors that led to where we are today. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, thanks, Manuela. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about the guide. Um, <clears throat> we've been working with uh, mining clients and other sectors on climate change adaptation for uh, more than the last 10 years. And certainly one of the drivers was SIA's uh, requirements to look at uh, impacts of the climate uh, on a project. But I think one of the biggest drivers for the guidance is when we were look started this process, a lot of the guidance available was simply an awareness building um, uh, guidance that you should consider climate change. What was really lacking is the uh, how to or um, you know, the steps in which climate change should be considered. So that was one of the big drivers that we saw in the guidance is to provide that more detailed uh, information on how uh, to do these assessments consistently um, uh, to you know, move from the uh, why you should do this work and into the how. Thank you. Can I now ask uh, both Charles and Sean, um, if you could kindly provide an overview of the Climate Change Adaptation Guide and its approach to risk assessments. Yeah, happy to. If you could go to the next slide, please. So what we tried to do, or what we aim to do with this guide, um, is recognizing that what's actually gonna happen from a climate change adaptation perspective on a site specific, on a particular site. It's going to be very site specific. We didn't feel that we could get into trying to develop guidance on how you would adapt to a whole range of different climate change impacts that could potentially occur on a site. Rather, what we wanted to do was, was describe a process that an operator could go through, a way to kind of approach this problem that would integrate into systems that companies already have, like their, their approaches that most companies already have to assessing and managing risk, so that this becomes one more piece of that risk assessment puzzle that needs to be considered. So Sean will explain it in more detail, but essentially what we've laid out is, is a three-stage process of approaching this and understanding. So starting with well, what are the risks that a, a certain facility or a certain company faces with respect to climate change, thinking about both those kind of direct risks, um, the physical impacts that occur on, could occur on site, and then the other kinds of risks and impacts that could also occur on transportation corridors, on their business uh, interruption, uh, supply chain, all those kinds of things that, that could in, come into play as secondary or, or tertiary impacts if uh, a primary impact occurs. And then from there, understanding those the vulnerabilities, understanding the risks, then what do you do about it? Maybe you don't need to implement ad adaptation measures right away. Um, maybe there's some risks that you consider acceptable. There's some that you wanna wait on. So how do you develop a roadmap to figure out how to approach if you've got you know, a whole range of different possible risks, potential vulnerabilities associated with climate, how do you then kind of develop a roadmap to figure out which ones you're gonna do, how you're gonna do it and when, and then from there, building in surveillance, building in uh, feedback mechanisms to understand if you're doing the right thing. And then because there's so much uncertainty around climate change and projection models and things like that, keeping that loop going so that you're, you're reevaluating that periodically. And with that, I'll turn it over to Sean to provide a bit more detail on the next slide. Thanks. So let me unpack this a little bit more um, in terms of how these three stages uh, interact and how they build uh, on each other. <clears throat> One of the things that we heard from 
the MAC members when we were developing this is it had to be applicable to all phases in the mine life. So um, this process, when it's moving from uh, left to right, starts with the mine at you know maybe the pre-feasibility or the feasibility stage, but it can apply to mines that are operating uh, in care and maintenance or enclosure. So um, it is a, applicable to all of these stages. So let me take you through it as if we were at a new um, uh, mine at the design stage. So the first stage, it builds on you know, this concept of climate risk assessment. And uh, you need to understand the current climate and both the future climate trends in order to be able to, to look at the risk assessment in terms of changes. Um, the risk assessment will identify vulnerabilities and then uh, look at what are the highest risks, the most important uh, vulnerabilities at the site uh, that can then be passed on to these other steps. And I think this is really key in the guidance where um, you know, a lot of guidance that was available has a risk assessment component. It's the decision analysis and then the continual improvement that is important um, uh, additions to this guidance. So the decision analysis looks at uh, uh, there are multiple uh, pathways. And I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more in my next slide. But you know, there are many, the difference between a conventional risk assessment and a climate change risk assessment is the time um, of when these risks could occur and the change in the risk over time. So the guidance document does speak about um, you know, these types of pathways and how you select them and looks at some multi-criteria analysis. The simplest one being you know, a cost-benefit analysis if the only considerations were uh, operational impacts, but it acknowledges uh, the input from the community of interest that Charles discussed. So there's other issues in addition to the mine itself, the uh, supply chain, the communities around the mine that are also important. So environmental issues have to be weighed, social issues have to be weighed. And so this multi-criteria analysis helps choose these pathways. And then once you have um, uh, developed a pathway, there's the implementation and this ongoing surveillance and an adaptive management approach as new information is available, as uh, more projections become more refined, um, there has to be this continual improvement process. So moving backwards, the arrows below the line, um, you know, represent this continual improvement process. So the first arrow within stage three could be uh, an update to um, an assessment report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, updating these projections. We're expecting an update next year or the year after in terms of this. So we had to incorporate this type of continual improvement. The next arrow going back to the decision analysis could represent um, updated information at the site that would uh, cause a reevaluation of this option analysis. You have more information, and so you're going to uh, put that back through this multi criteria um, analysis to, to validate these paths. And then the last arrow right to the beginning could be a change in the mind plan, an extension in the mind life, where you would go back and look at that risk assessment. Um, uh, from the first stage to then go through uh, the full process. So if we move to the next slide, I just want to, to, to further um, break down how this first stage and the second stage interact. And what I wanted to highlight here is this, this time emergence of uh, signals or triggers that are going to um, cause action to be taken in the future. So the risk assessment uh, is looking at the change in risk. You know, what are the vulnerabilities? What are the projected uh, climate conditions? And the outcome from that could be an, access, an acceptable risk. So you would monitor um, you know, the triggers or the thresholds that would, would, would say that that risk is no longer acceptable. Um, you could gather more information on these triggers or the thresholds, and you, you are going to uh, collect information. You could say we have a clearly defined path. We know what uh, triggers will cause action in the future, but we're going to do that at some time in the future because it makes sense to wait to implement that, um, uh, not take action right away. Or you may say 
that action, immediate action is, is um, uh, beneficial. It could be something that is easy to do at the design phase or the construction phase, um, and then would give you resilience now and also uh, into the future. Uh, so that's an important part of the, um, you know, this, this pathways approach and how that, um, uh, you know, the timing aspects looks at that. So let me expand that with an, another hypothetical example um, moving forward. So here's an example of um, uh, uh, five different pathways that could be selected at a site. The pathway A would be the you know, the, the ex risk is acceptable now and under future climate conditions. Pathway E would be um, invest in the uh, more resilient infrastructure now um, and do the work um, in the short term. And then the other paths look at uh, taking action uh, in the medium or the long term. And what the guidance um, uh, provides examples for is how these reevaluation points, how the continual improvement process will look at when um, these evaluation points come up and when and, and how action should be taken in the future. So if we, if we go through this, then you know, the next slide shows that here's the selected uh, adaptation pathways. There's a choice in the longer term in terms of the final pathway. So they're selecting two different pathways. And then if we go to um, the future where, you know, looking back after the mine is into closure and post-closure, what may have happened is the pathways were rearranged based on new input that happened during the life of the mine. And that's again, an important part of the guidance to say this continual improvement process can anticipate and um, incorporate these types of changes. So um, I think the guidance really helps outline that. And although it's written for the mining sector, this thought process can apply to an, a number of other sectors as well. Thank you. Uh, both for that overview. How have other standards or guidelines currently in existence been considered, particularly with respect to current adoption rate? How would the guide compare, or rather, what are some key differences with recognized climate change related standards? If I could start with Sean, please. So we looked at, at the, the start of developing the guidance we conducted a literature search to look what was out there. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel uh, in terms of uh, um, you know, developing uh, guidance that was already available. So we looked at the ISO um, uh, uh, standards in terms of risk assessment and climate change risk assessment. We looked at engineering standards such as the uh, Public Infrastructure Engineering Vulnerability Committee, the PIVC process that's developed by Engineers Canada and has been uh, referenced by the World Engineering Council. Uh, we looked at information from development banks to name a few areas. But what we, what we found was the guidance um, either was focused on the how, you know, why, and didn't go in detail in terms of the how-to for the, the mining sector. So um, in, in building on that information, what we really tried to focus on is how to incorporate the uncertainty and how climate change risk is a modifier of um, the site's current risk, that it wasn't something that had to be considered outside the risk assessment process, but rather building the uncertainty of a claim changing climate within that risk assessment process was um, the, uh, uh, the value that we brought out in terms of developing the guidance. Thank you, Sean. Charles? Yeah, just to build on Sean's point, um, <clears throat> As he noted, there is a lot of existing guidance out there, um, not necessarily suitable for what we were trying to do, but that field has also continued to change. And one good example of that is, is after that literature review was done, um, International Council of Mining and Metals uh, released in late 2019 a guidance document on climate change adaptation. So Mac, we're in close communications with ICMM on that. We actually put our project on hold for a short time because we wanted to make sure that, that what we were saying, uh, particularly within the mining industry, was aligned with that existing ICMM guidance. But the, what the MAC guidance does, I, I think, is go into a greater level of detail in terms of how you can approach climate change adaptation on a site-specific basis. And I think one thing that's important to emphasize with the guidance that we didn't say right off the top is that it is focused on 
the physical impacts that are, could occur in a changing climate. Um, the, it doesn't address anything to do with, with mitigation on the emissions side of things. It doesn't address anything to do with um, adaptation around adapting to changing legal requirements, policy requirements, things like changes in um, GHG emissions trading, GHG pricing, things like that. So I think that's important to understand that that's, that's very deliberately how we've scoped it, you know, on those kind of physical impacts that can occur in a climbing, changing climate. Thank you both. Um, Maya and Dan, as representatives of the investment community, a key stakeholder group, how might you consider efforts by a corporate to implement the Climate Change Adaptation Guide in the context of your investment decisions? While the guide has a more technical slant, would you consider a discussion on a corporate's progress on adapting climate change related risk management, a useful and meaningful indicator of the issuer's commitment to sound ESG management? If I could start with Maya. Thank you and good afternoon everyone. In terms of answering the question about how we'd consider an issuer's implementation of the climate adaptation guide, I think it's perhaps useful to start by providing a bit of context into how RBC Global Asset Management would consider climate change as part of our investment decisions when we invest in a company. So as an asset manager with over $300 billion in assets under management, we're a fiduciary of our clients' assets, which means we have a legal responsibility to consider all material factors that may impact long-term risk-adjusted returns. For ourselves, we consider ESG factors and climate change specifically as a material factor in that decision making. So what this means is that our investment teams, all of our investment teams globally, and there are over 20 of them, they integrate both financial and then extra financial information. So information about a corporate issuer's approach to climate change in their decision making. And when we talk about technical expertise, I think it's important to realize that within our investment teams, investment teams, they're highly technical individuals with deep sector expertise, and that includes deep expertise in mining. So we have that technical expertise that sits within our investment teams already. And that's where the technical nature of these types of guidance documents is very useful for us as well. Now this approach to climate change, what that means for a corporate issuer, such as a mining company, is that their management of environmental, social and governance factors, including climate change, is something we're already considering today. So whether companies are aware of it or not, we're already looking for that information. So where this guide has a role to play from our perspective is enhancing the quality, the depth, and the scope of that information that we have available to us. So certainly from an investor's perspective, we think it's hugely beneficial to have an industry or sector initiative that seeks to provide greater scope, depth, and approach to how uh, a company would look at the physical impacts of climate change, put in place risk management processes, and then ideally integrate that into strategic decision-making, financial decision-making, and governance. One important consideration I would make, however, is for companies to think about once they or as they are implementing this guidance, how will they be reporting or disclosing the information of how they've done so and how will they share that information with investors? It's important for us to have access to that information so that we can help and enhance our ability to integrate that in our decisions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maya. Dan? Hi, good afternoon. Thanks very much. Um, so I, look, I think efforts to implement the climate change adaptation guide will be important for a couple of reasons. Uh, at the highest level, I mean, I think it'll help manage the risks of the business as they relate to the climate change reality. So like the bottom line is companies set expectations and investors and analysts rely on those expectations to value the stock. So, you know, failure to account for and mitigate risks like climate change can cause expectations to be missed. That'll have a negative impact on earnings, reputation, share price, so I think the guide can be a useful tool to provide a framework and structure for risk management of climate change to make sure the companies are prob properly considering and managing the relevant risks. Uh, secondly, I think the guide will help manage ESG risks that companies face from investors scrutinizing the sector. You know, there's not a lot of patience for excuses around environmental failures, which in some cases can be related to climate change, and it can be very difficult for companies to get out of the penalty box uh, after environmental infractions. So, you know, poorly managing climate change risks that result in environmental failure can result in multiple compressions in the stocks that can have a long-term impact on a company. Uh, 
And then finally, I'd say I, I think efforts by corporates to imp implement the adaptation guide will help create a template and a framework for discussion with key stakeholders um, uh, about the actions the company's taking on climate change. And that's not just with equity and fixed income investors, but with local communities, governments, regulators, unions, really any stakeholder in, in, in a company. At, at the end of the day, climate change is top of mind for our investors and a discussion around a framework that a company is putting in place to address climate change risk, I think would be a useful and material indicator of proactive ESG management. And I would say, you know, more than that, it signals to us a, a proactive risk management strategy in general at the company. Great. Thank you both very much. A number of institutional investors have been more vocal in their stance with respect to decarbonization, climate change related risks, and ESG more broadly. State Street, for example, recently called on companies to communicate to investors the short, medium, and long-term impacts of COVID-19 and explain how they may affect the company's approach to material ESG issues as part of long-term strategy. Others, like BlackRock and Vanguard, have stated that ESG disclosures remain critical. Could I ask you, Maya and Dan, to provide an overview of your respective firm's position in this regard? I'll start with Maya, please. Thank you. So in terms of RBC Global Asset Management's approach to ESG, we do have an approach to responsible investment, which is our guiding framework for how we look at environmental, social, and governance factors across the firm. I'm going to focus specifically on climate change here in this discussion. Next slide, please. And before going into how our firm looks at climate change and integrates it into the investment process, I just want to give a high-level view of how we look at climate change in that approach. So firstly, at RBC GAM, our position on climate change is that it's a pressing issue and a systemic risk with the potential to affect the global economy, markets, and societies. And as investors with multi-year, if not decade, time horizons and portfolio exposure across the global economy, this means that climate change may be a potential material issue for all of our global investments across all sectors, for equity, fixed income, and real assets. So when we look at climate change, we do consider both those physical risks and opportunities of climate change and those transition impacts that, um, that arise from efforts to both mitigate and manage rising GHG emissions. So these impacts then have the potential to affect the returns of companies that we are invested in, affect their balance sheet, company or asset valuations or productivity. And this is why we see climate change as a material factor that we need to consider the impact of as it may impact our long-term risk-adjusted returns. And this is through the possibility of mispricing of assets, asset stranding, credit risk default, or even a broader destabilizing effect that can increase the volatility or uncertainty in our markets. So I put this slide here because I think it's an important point that when we focus on climate change and we look at investing companies and corporates to see how they're managing this issue, it's about the value consideration. How does this impact financial performance? It's not a values decision. It's really looking at that potential impact to impact long-term risk-adjusted returns. Next slide, please. So in terms of our strategic approach and view on climate change, in April of this year, we launched a climate change strategy that seeks to formalize and expand the actions we're taking to address climate change across three main areas or pillars. And when it comes to ESG more broadly, our enterprise approach to, approach to responsible investment is also aligned with these three pillars. And these are really the key actions or areas that we focus on when we look at how to implement ESG and climate specifically within our investment process. So this first pillar focuses on fully integrating consideration of climate change factors into those investment decisions. And we do that in a number of ways. First, this year we've been rolling out um, a program to certainly build expertise on climate change and knowledge within our investment teams. When those investment teams are making decisions, we're ensuring that they have access to data and analytics relating to investee companies' approach to climate change and how they're looking at these issues. And then certainly providing additional research insights and analytics, not just on how companies are looking at climate change, identifying risks and opportunities today, but also how they're going to be doing it in those forward-looking scenarios or projections. So if you look at the climate adaptation guide, 
and the approach of looking at looking at climate change and doing risk assessments, then taking a forward looking view and putting in place adaptation measures. This aligns very much with how we're looking at all the companies within our portfolio and then aggregating that insight up at a portfolio and then a firm level. In terms of the second pillar that we look at as part of our strategy, this relates to the fact that we are an active manager. So we actively engage with the companies that we're invested in. And this is an important piece in terms of how we approach climate change and ESG more broadly, is that our investment teams engage regularly with companies one-on-one -on, -one on these issues and they want to hear how they're approaching climate change. They want to make sure that when we're looking at companies and we're investing in companies, that they are able to articulate their climate-related risks and opportunities and what they're doing to mitigate those. But this year, uh, as part of the rollout of this uh, strategy, we've also enhanced the view we take on how we look at climate change, where we've worked with our investment teams and developed engagement guides, including one specific to mining, on what are the issues, the material issues to the mining sector when it comes to climate change and what to look for in terms of a response from investing companies when we engage with them in terms of how they're managing climate risk. Climate adaptation is certainly a significant part of that as well. The other piece I just wanted to highlight in terms of how we engage with companies is it's not just individually and one-on-one, -on -one, but it's also as part of collaborative engagement, such as the Climate Action 100 Plus. And I think we're seeing this more and more on a range of ESG factors, but climate as well, where investors are working collaboratively with other investors to engage companies on these issues. And what they are looking for and what we're looking for in these engagements is more insight from companies on how they're looking at climate change how they're conducting the risk assessments, how they're integrating this into strategy, what type of capital investments are being put towards these initiatives, and what is the underlying governance process or decision making that's um, involved in that as well. A third pillar of our strategy is focusing on the work we're doing with our clients, so our institutional and retail clients to develop investment solutions that meets their needs. And it's here that I think we're really seeing a huge amount of interest and growth from our clients in both ESG as well as climate change. Our clients want to know how their investments are considering the impacts of environmental, social, and governance factors. And as Dan said very well, there is certainly very little patience for there not being an answer that you can provide as to how you are looking at these factors. So as we look and see more of these products that come onto the marketplace that focus on climate specifically, as, although there's certainly others focusing on other ESG factors, whether it's climate mitigation, climate transition, or climate adaptation for companies or issuers who want to be included within these new funds and thematic areas, it will be important that they're able to meet those eligibility criteria. So that's a high level view of how we look at climate change and then integrate it across the three pillars of our approach. And I'll hand it over to Diane here. Thank you. Thank Great. you very much. Thank, oh, sorry. Maya. Go ahead, Dan. Sorry, thanks. Um, okay, so in terms of how we approach it at CIBC Asset Management, um, I mean, ESG analysis, which includes climate change risk assessment, is core to our investment analysis and decision-making process. So. We incorporate uh, ESG analysis at the analyst level. Uh, we're set up much like the sell side. We have sector specialists who know the companies in their sectors inside and out. And one of the analyst jobs is to screen for ESG risks. Um, if you could flip to the next slide, please. So, so what we do, we have detailed questionnaires that cover E, S, and G that we apply to each company. We go through corporate disclosure um, and engage with management teams and boards of directors to score as many questions as we can for every company. Um, we try to put some numeracy into the process. Uh, we score the questions zero to 10, and that way we can try to compare companies uh, against each other within the sector and across sectors on ESG uh, metrics. So in the same way that we would put a buy, hold, sell rating on a stock, uh, we also put ESG ratings on uh, each company. And you can see on the slide um, from minus two, uh, a laggard to plus two best in class. Uh, as a group at CIBC Asset Management, we cover over 300 companies, and each of these would have an ESG score and ranking. Um, next slide, please. The, we put the biggest influence on governance. Uh, our view is that good governance is a significant contributor to proper environmental and social practices, and that includes managing and mit mitigating climate change risks. Um, so you can see on the slide, just trying to give a bit of an example of how we come up with our score. Uh, we'll run through questions on ES and G 
uh, score them zero to 10, uh, weight ES and G to get an all in combined score, which we'll then compare uh, to other companies in the sector. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of what we do with the data, ESG issues are considered when voting proxies, but also, in, and more fundamentally, I mean, poor ESG uh, at a company becomes a barrier to us investing. Um, the bottom line um, is that if it screens poorly, then it's a difficult investment decision for us to make. This slide is just giving you an example of a few of the different things we look for in the ESG categories. Um, so you can see in environment, we're looking at uh, climate change issues, water, recycling, uh, waste management. In social license, we're looking for details on health and safety, uh, labor policies and relations, human rights. In governance, we're looking for genuine board independence. We're looking for alignment of board and management through ownership uh, of the SOC. Uh, we consider business ethics, legal and regulatory uh, compliance and risks. And all that um, drives a view on the risk that the company faces, which has an impact on the equity value that we apply for each company. Um, so that's how we think about it at uh, CIBC. Thank you. Thank you very much, both uh, Maya and, and Dan. Um, you know, both uh, forward-looking uh, perspectives. How do you see this position evolving in the next decade? And do you believe that the 2020 pandemic will ultimately have a material effect on this evolution? If I could start with Dan. Sure. Th thanks again. So. I would say, I mean, look, I think ESG analysis is becoming table stakes and I expect that'll continue in the coming years. I don't necessarily see the pandemic either accelerating or decelerating the evolution of ESG analysis. I think it's in full swing. I do think the pandemic has shifted some of the focus for ESG in the short term more to health and safety issues, but ESG focus naturally does shift from time to time when issues and events come up. I would say I do think mining is actually ahead on the ESG game because even before ESG was a trendy topic, as a group, we've always been talking about things like water management and First Nations relationships, tailings dam, CSR programs, because these are the issues and factors that give the miners social license to operate. So without proper ESG programs in place, you know, local communities will blockade mines, governments will pull permits. So I think the mining sector is actually in a good place to lead on ESG over the next decade because we've been having these discussions for years. I, I do think where there is room for improvement in the mining sector is on the governance side. Uh, when we talk about ESG in this sector, we rarely get past the E and the S. And I do think the industry has some work to do on the G side uh, to be considered a leader in that space. Thank you, Dan. Maya? Yeah, thank you. And I think I'd echo a lot of what Dan had said there is I think the focus on ESG has been underway for a number of years now. And certainly we recognize the importance of ESG before the pandemic. We've certainly seen that play out through the pandemic and will continue to be important after the pandemic has passed. I am, I think moving forward when we look at ESG and we look at the impact of the pandemic, I think what's probably done more than anything else is really highlight the S factors or the social factors, which I think in many ways previously had been more difficult to quantify and perhaps less of a focus for many sectors. Although to Dan's point, I would certainly agree that many of the extractive and resource-based sectors have focused on that aspect for many years, but I think really what the pandemic has done is brought out in very real live time the impact of those S factors. And moving forward, I think there will be more focus on those issues such as employee health and safety, benefits, sick time, supply chain risk management, business continuity planning, human capital management, diversity and inclusion, um, certainly brought about by some of the other coexisting factors that are happening now in terms of uh, you know, the impact of the global recession, as well then as uh, the protests internationally around e inequality. And I do think governance is going to continue to be a focus and an area. Good corporate governance is essential. And we see that as a foundation for decision making about all of our investments. I think the other outcome I would maybe raise about the impact of the pandemic is that it has likely sharpened the focus of companies, of investors, of governments on the real impact of long-term and systemic risks of which a pandemic would be, but also of one such as climate change. And I think it's brought into sharp reality the importance of putting in place risk management processes, anticipating how you would adapt and enable your business to move forward in the case of those types of risks. 
uh, I think it, it really puts it in kind of a stark reality of how do these long-term systemic risks play out and the impacts of them across the economy and markets and society. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, turning to issuers and how they may be approaching or possibly selecting financiers to work with, how are asset managers or owners engaging with issuers on ESG issues and do you see any change in their activities as a result? If I could start with Maya. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this issue of engagement is really important to us. And if you'll remember back to that slide I put up about our approach to climate change, which is also how we approach ESG factors more broadly, active stewardship engagement is a core pillar of what we do. So our investment teams make decisions about the companies and assets they invest in based on both financial and extra financial factors. An important component of how we are active investors or managers is that we engage actively with those investee companies. And those engagements focus both on direct engagements, where we work with companies, meet with them for investment teams to raise and discuss issues that they believe are financially material to the performance of the company. And certainly ESG factors and climate change specifically are a focus of many of those discussions. I raised it earlier, but I do want to take a couple of minutes to just focus on those collaborative initiatives that are also an important part of engagement. We think they're valuable when investors work together collaboratively on some of these key ESG issues to engage with companies so that companies have a group of investors they can have these conversations with instead of having to engage with 10, 15, 20 investors separately. And some of these ESG factors are really where this is a benefit. So we certainly engage as part of the 30% club with companies on encouraging gender diversity at the board level and achieving a minimum of 30% women on boards and at the executive management level by 2022. So this is an important demonstration of that engagement. And then also through that Climate Action 100 group, which focuses on 160 plus companies globally and engaging with them on the actions they're taking and encouraging more action to address climate change, to implement effective governance on climate change and produce disclosures on climate change. The last piece I talk about with engagement is also the proxy voting um, aspect of engagement where the way with which um, as active owners, we vote our proxies on behalf of our clients on shareholder proposals, we also integrate and ESG considerations as part of that process. As an example, between 20, uh, January and June of this year, we voted over 25,000 proxies and our proxy voting guidelines, while we implement them on a case by case basis, they include consideration of climate change. So part of our leverage or our ability to have conversations with companies is also in terms of how we vote on shareholder proposals related to climate change. And I think we're certainly seeing that ESG factors, climate change specifically, will continue to be a focus, both in terms of shareholder proposals that are put forward, as well then as the engagements that companies have with, com with investors. And you certainly want to have something to say when you're speaking to investors about your approach to climate change. Uh, on the last question or point here about how do you track engagements or what is the outcome of those engagements, that's a lot more difficult in terms of what actions you see in response to engagement. But we've certainly seen a, through the collaborative engagements particularly and through the one-on-one -on -one conversations and engagements we have, that they tend to be quite productive in terms of really understanding where companies are at, where they're going, and how they're going to get there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dan? Yeah, th thanks again. Um, so, uh, you know, fully agree with Maya on her first point. Uh, engagement with companies is extremely important to us in our inv active investment process. So we're dedicating a portion of every meeting we have with management teams to engage on specific ESG issues that we think are relevant either to the industry as a whole or specific to each company. Uh, in a lot of cases, the issues are obvious and clearly business related. In some cases, we look to dig in on a specific topic. Um, you know, some tangible examples, you know, post the Brumadinho tailings dam disaster, we spent a lot of time with companies on on tailings uh, and issues around that, trying to understand who's exposed where and what the risks are. Right now, we're talking to issues, uh, we're talking to issuers about First Nation sensitivity, given the Rio Tinto Jukin Gorge uh, incident in Australia. And obviously, we're talking about health and safety during the pandemic. Uh, climate change is also an issue we're talking to companies about. We're looking uh, for details on mitigation plans, risk management, 
and steps that companies are taking to reduce carbon footprints. We're trying to figure out who's ahead on climate change, who has risks that they're exposed to that are outside of their control, and who's mitigating the risks where they can. I would say um, we are seeing some positive uh, changes in activity from issuers in recent years. I would say some of that is inevitable given that it's an area that investors are intensely focused on. Uh, disclosure is getting better uh, on ESG in general, but I do still think there's room to improve. I think the mining sector has a lot of data on ESG and I think as a group is still just figuring out how to best present that data and tell the story in a more clear and concise way. Thank you very much. Much of the implementation of ESG initiatives typically rests with technical specialists within a corporate's organization. Indeed, often C-suites and board directors receive abridged general status updates, and these can be further abridged for the purposes of public disclosure. Going forward, do you anticipate continued pressure on corporates to further increase disclosure on climate-related risks and ESG performance? Might institutional investors, for example, start requesting progress reports on managing identified climate-related risks? If I can start with Dan, please. Yeah, thank, thanks very much. So I think we're already there on this one. Uh, at CIBC, we're looking for progress reports on managing climate-related and all ESG-related risks. Um, I talked about our ESG scorecard before. We're looking for data annually and in some cases quarterly to update our questionnaires and reassess our ratings and outlooks uh, for ESG on all the companies that we cover. I would say, like I recognize there's a cost associated with this disclosure from the companies, but I also think there's an opportunity for the issuers especially for those who can take a lead on this and articulate their message clearly uh, to the investment community. I think fundamentally there's two ways to get your share price higher. One is to grow your earnings and the second is to expand your multiple. So no question ESG disclosure will cost a bit more and that has a bit of a negative impact on earnings, but I think the opportunity is on the multiple expansion side for the companies that get uh, the ESG right. Um, and I, you know, to your point on, uh, on ESG initiatives within the companies resting with technical specialists, I would say you know, investors are pretty savvy and capable of digesting technical information. Uh, a lot of companies will bring their ESG leaders out when they go marketing or to conferences, and that gives investors a chance to ask questions directly to the people on the ground doing the work. Uh, companies are hosting events specifically with their ESG people to give investors a chance to ask questions outside of a normal marketing meeting. And I would say, you know, making those uh, people within your organizations available to the investment community is very helpful. Thank you very much, Dan. Maya? I'd certainly echo what Dan says is that already there is certainly the expectation, the request that there are climate related disclosures, ESG related disclosures that companies provide. And I think in a lot of ways, companies are already starting to have realized that there is an appetite and a need for this and able to respond to that. It's certainly been the case over the last two to three years where we've seen there is a leap in terms of the scope, the depth, the breadth of disclosure on ESG and climate specifically. And I think that disclosure isn't only around how a company is approaching these issues and managing and mitigating these issues, but again, wanting to understand the governance of these issues. So who has governance oversight for these ESG issues that are material to the company, including climate change? How are those being reviewed and considered? And how is management engaged on it? And that comes into play then when, as investors, we meet with these companies of wanting to know and understand how is management aware of, part of, and making decisions based on this information. So certainly important to have at these discussions if those who um, are in the room, make sure you have the people in the room who do have this knowledge, this background, this technical expertise. I think those conversations on ESG are getting far more technical. And to Dan's point and my point earlier, that technical expertise, it does sit within our investment teams as well. And they want to know those details. It's not enough anymore, perhaps five, 10 years ago, but not, certainly not now. It's not enough to say we have a policy. It's on our website. We'll share it with you after. We want to have deep conversations about this. And I'd actually take this point maybe a little bit further to say it's not just investors who are seeking enhanced disclosures on ESG or climate change, but we're also seeing, and I think we're going to continue to see uh, regulators, legislation, and other requirements that are specific to climate-related disclosures. And we've certainly seen that in Europe and the UK, 
and even here in Canada in June with the government announcing that TCFD or climate disclosures are required for access to the large employer emergency financing facility. So being able to get ahead of some of these requirements but that may start to be coming down the road as well in terms of how are you looking at ESG factors, it's certainly worth putting in place now because it is just going to continue in my view. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned TCFD. The Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures produced recommendations for institutional investors with respect to a, a climate change strategy for their portfolios. In regards to risk management, the TCFD recommends that investors identify, assess, and manage climate-related risks, focusing on processes used to assess materiality and locating and using climate-related data. The TCFD guidance also addresses risk measurement, prioritization, mitigation, and monitoring. Based on what you've learned about the Climate Change Adaptation Guide presented by Mack and Golder, in your view, could the guide and its outputs of, of the implementation be used to support issuers in meeting the TCFD recommendations, as well as uh, those of asset managers? If I could start with Maya, please. So the short answer on that is a very clear and definitive yes. So I think one of the pieces with the TCFD that I think is important to recognize is who developed the TCFD. So the TCFD is a framework developed by the Financial Stability Board, which is uh, the G20 finance ministers. So again, the focus on climate change, the TCFD disclosure is really about the financial materiality of this issue for companies. And in terms of TCFD and looking at how a company is uh, managing and addressing their climate risks and opportunities and integrating it, as you said, into strategy, risk management, governance, the risk or the metrics and targets, part of what has been so helpful and beneficial of the TCFD, which came out in 2017, is establishing that common language of how we start to look at climate change and how we start to implement practices to address how we're then managing and mitigating the impacts of it. The Climate Adaptation Guide and its focus on the physical risks of climate change at a site level and being able to look at the adaptation measures and look at it not just currently, but also under those future forward pathways is a key component of TCFD, doing that climate scenario analysis, where you're not just looking at the current climate conditions and those impacts, but you're looking forward at the uncertainty that climate change poses and looking at how you may need to invest in resilience measures today in anticipation of those. So the other point I think I'd say with TCFD is it's a framework of recommended disclosures. And with disclosure, the most important thing is to start the process of disclosure. And what we as investors want to know is we want to know how you're looking at these climate risks and opportunities. Which ones do you think are material? What actions are you putting in place? And what's your thought process about this? I think often there's a bit of a hesitation sometimes to start our start down the path of doing some of the disclosures that are perhaps required to be more in depth because there's a feeling that you have to have all the answers when you start. And really as investors, what we want companies to know is just start. It's not a box checking exercise. We really wanna understand your thought process, your assumptions, what you consider material risk, why are they material risks, where you think you are, where you wanna to get to and how you're going to get there. And really that's the most important piece of it but definitely the Climate Adaptation Guide is a great step forward for the mining industry to be able to respond to the expectations of the TCFD. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Dan? Yeah, thanks again. Um, yeah, so I mean, I agree with what, what Maya said. Um, at CIBC, like, you know, as signatories to the UNPRI, we've assessed our portfolios for climate change related risk, and that's part of our responsibility as a signatory. Um, I do think that the Climate Change Adaptation Guide can provide a framework for discussion with the companies, and that'll help us assess our risk on climate change going forward in our portfolios. So I think that's important. Um, you know, disclosure by the companies as they implement the Adaptation Guide can help us screen and assess which companies are ahead on climate change risk and which companies still have some work to do. But, but like Maya said, like, you know, get started and start putting stuff out and, you know, move forward from there. Um, I would also say that, you know, just reading through the guide in preparation for this event has already given me some ideas about areas to discuss 
uh, with companies when we next engage on ESG and specifically on climate change. Excellent. Um, Charles and Sean, based on the decision-making approach institutional investors such as RBC and CIBC have adopted in respect of assessing climate change related risk exposures, what are your thoughts on how risk assessments undertaken in accordance with the Climate Change Adaptation Guide might be best used to support discussions between corporates and institutional investors and other key stakeholders? If I could start with Sean, please. Thank you. When we developed the guidance, um, we looked at it very much as a bottom-up process that uh, the guidance was focused on a individual facility and the surrounding community of interest. Um, so given that TCFD and investors are more on a portfolio uh, basis, I think there could be a, you know, where it's not directly applicable, but I think the discussions that we've had so far and our thought process in developing the guidance on the how, uh, that a site level we can identify and develop these adaptation pathways, focuses in on exactly what we've heard today in terms of investors wanna know how companies are dealing with this. So um, through this bottom-up approach, I think the guidance can really increase the dialogue between uh, you know, the facility uh, staff, the engineers and geoscientists who are dealing with climate data, dealing with design, who need to address as part of their own professional practice this uncertainty around climate change, and then um, talk to the corporate risk managers who are also dealing with risk, and then the investors who need to understand the level of risk that we've heard today, that the guidance really by framing this at a site level can really help uh, move this forward. And I think that um, the way I have heard the TCFD uh, been uh, described and I think it, it echoes what Maya said about, you know, just start, right? That, you know, the TCFD starts with a story um, and then ends with a uh, math equation. And so the um, guidance is really can form part of that textbook for the detailed quantitative uh, risk assessment uh, at the site level that can look at the, the cost benefits, the financial implications of a climate change, and really help understand how uh, a site and then rolled up to the enterprise is dealing with these risks. Thank you. Charles, please. I don't have anything specifically to add to, to Sean's comment in response to the particular question, but just to sort of this, this theme of the, of the panel and, and the whole, I think one thing to emphasize that the very we have a really good illustration of the really strong and potent role that investors can play in driving ESG. And that comes from the, from the tailings side of things that, that Dan already uh, mentioned. Roll back the clock to uh, late January of 2019 and a failure of a tailings facility in Brazil, almost 3,000 fatalities. And within days, a group of institutional investors led by the Church of England Pension Fund had already issued an immediate call for the development of a global standard for tailings management. That investor group then went on to lead a push to get a greater disclosure out of the industry around risks associated with tailings management, um, sending a letter uh, ultimately, I think, to almost over 800 uh, different mining companies globally requesting information on their tailings facilities. Many companies did respond to that. There is now a global database, something that never existed before because of that push from the investor group. And that global tailing standard does now exist. It was released in August. Um, so I think that really illustrates the, the, the potential power of the investment community, particularly through a mechanism like the, the signatories, the UNPRI, because they were one of the, the co-convening partners in developing that, that standard for tailings management. So it's important to recognize that there's a lot of muscle there that can be flexed very effectively when chosen to do so. Great, thank you both. As we near the conclusion of today's panel discussion, I would ask each of our panelists, if you would, what is from your specific context on this panel, one single most important recommendation for an organization as it considers investments in ESG initiatives? If I could start with Maya, please. Yeah, thank you. I'll maybe give two words instead of a single one. And those two words would be materiality and transparency. So starting with materiality, 
focus on the ESG issues that are most material to your business and everything else should be driven strategically from there. For many mining companies, most mining companies, climate change is going to want be one of those material issues, but identify yourselves. What are your material issues? What are the drivers of those issues? How are you managing the risks associated with it? And how have you put in place your governance processes to address it? The second word, transparency, this gets back to the discussion about disclosure and TCFD. Tell your story because investors are looking for this information. We are evaluating, assessing how companies are managing ESG issues. We're looking very deeply at climate change. Be transparent about where you are in this journey, in this process, and get started. Again, don't wait for all of the, perhaps to have that perfect package. And start having those conversations because that's part of what we're looking for as well as an understanding of where you're at as a company. Thank you. Thank you. Sean, please. So the guidance document speaks directly to the ESG. And let me give you an example. Um, in terms of the vulnerabilities that are required to be assessed and are there's examples of these types of vulnerabilities in the uh, guidance, speaks to how uh, a site can impact the environment um, and how climate change can affect that. Um, the focus in the guidance in terms of the community of interests speaks to the social, that it isn't just the physical aspects of the climate change risk on the site infrastructure, but the physical aspects on how the site and the supply chain fits into the larger social um, aspects and the communities around the mines. And then I think the continual improvement process and how the guidance links to the sites uh, ISO processes for uh, continual improvement and the risk register that we've talked about at the sites speaks to better governance and uh, can help with the G component. Thank you, Sean. Charles? I think to build on, on Sean's point, I, I think it's, there's a risk, I think, with, with dealing with climate change adaptation to have a bit of tunnel vision and a real need to think big picture with it it's kind of easy to focus on, well, okay, it's kind of obvious we could have some issues around water management. If we're in a permafrost area, we could have issues around permafrost. There could be kinds of impacts that could lead to catastrophic events. But the picture is a lot bigger than that. Um, a lot of cases, the kinds of impacts that might be expected um, are not likely to be catastrophic, but they may still be quite significant. In some cases, they may be related to things other than water management, permafrost, those, those kinds of things. In some cases, they may even be off-site. Your greatest vulnerability at a particular site could be the bridge on the provincially owned access road to your site. If that washes out in a flood, you're now in a business disruption situation, business disruption situation, even though you didn't even own that piece of infrastructure. So really important to, to think big picture in this. It, absolutely thinking about from a human health perspective, from an environment perspective in those terms, terms of those types of impacts, but also thinking about it uh, from a potential for business disruption, disruption of supply chains, things like that, so that you're taking as holistic approach as possible to how you're identifying and, and assessing the potential risks and then figuring out how to mitigate them. Thank you. And lastly, Dan, please. Thanks again. Um, so at a high level, you know, just a general ESG comment, I, I mean, I think it's becoming table stakes for the investment communities. Um, I realize that today was a climate change panel, so we spent a lot of time on the E part of the equation today, but my view of the G is not getting enough attention. And in my opinion, good governance is the most important part of the ESG equation, because uh, I think governance sets up the E and the S and the whole company for success. So I would encourage you know, boards and um, management teams to focus on that where they can. Specifically with respect to climate change, uh, it's an issue that's front and center with our investors. So clearly it's important to us as well. Uh, the impacts from climate change are meaningful and wide reaching and to the extent that companies can get ahead and manage and mitigate the risks and to the extent that the climate change adaptation guide can help you get there. I think it's an initiative worth pursuing. Um, thanks very much for having me. I appreciate everyone's time today. Thank you all panelists for sharing your uh, perspectives and your insights. Um, and now we'll uh, move to our questions. We did receive some through the registration process. Um, a couple actually refer to triggers and thresholds mentioned in the guide. Um, the guidance talks about triggers and thresholds. Can you explain those in more detail? 
and how they can be used by investors as part of their review of the documentation. Sean, if I could ask you to just elaborate a little bit more, and then I have a question for Dan and Maya. Okay, thanks. So if we go to um, the, the, this idea, the, this concept of um, triggers and thresholds, I think it's uh, a good way to explain in terms of what the previous standard of care was and what the emerging standard of care for uh, engineers and geoscientists are. So I think we've got a, a back pocket slide on this that might help. So in the past, um, their good engineering included a safety factor. Um, there was a design and then there was a safety factor above that. So if you were looking at um, designing something, you would have a design criteria and then you would have a safety factor. So that could be considered um, uh, a, you know, a trigger for action when you got to, to here. But now the accepted, pack, uh, accepted understanding is you know, the current load, the current uh, climate is not an indicator of future climate. So in the future, there's gonna be a greater uncertainty. So now you're looking not just at your design criteria, but how more um, uh, safety you need about that. And that really is, I think, focusing in on where, where the guidance provides a lot of uh, technical issue in terms of how you look at these triggers and thresholds. So now, um, you know, if you were looking at a permafrost example where uh, you were designing to a ground temperature of, you know, minus one or minus five degrees uh, uh, C, then you could monitor that on the long term. And if the ground temperature was increasing, you could take action. And so that's one of the thresholds and the triggers. When you exceed a threshold, that's where you are getting into this level of an unacceptable risk. And the guidance speaks to that uh, so that uh, you can identify those risks and take action to bring you back into your acceptable level of risk. Thank you, Sean. Um, Dan and, uh, and then Maya, um, would the use of uh, triggers and thresholds or rather more clarity around those add to investor confidence in the information or data that's provided to the investment community? Um, yeah, short, short answer is, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think it signals to investors that there's a framework for considering climate change and for risk management within the company. I think it's part of a bigger picture that shows good risk management practices that, uh, that that's being considered. Thank you. Maya, anything to add? Yeah, I would just add to that. It's, you know, not necessarily so much about investor confidence as investor information. And it's important information about good risk management. And I think that's really what it provides. And when we're talking about something like climate change, we want to be looking at how those thresholds may be changing over time under different scenarios. And how are you then putting in place mitigants, actions, adaptations to manage those? So they're also an indicator for us of how a company is looking at climate change, which scenario or which pathway are they anticipating and how are they then putting in place sufficient buffer or sufficient um, adaptation measures to build their resilience. So there's certainly important indicator and important information as we look holistically at how a particular company, particular site is putting in place risk management practices for climate change. Thank you. Um, another question for Maya and then Dan. Um, historically, asset managers and hedge funds have focused on shorter term results. In your opinion, do you anticipate sustainability investing to ultimately cause a shift in investor mindset to recognize the need for companies to invest capital towards ESG management, despite perhaps lower near term returns? Maya? Yeah, so I think there are a few things to unpack here, which I'll try to do quickly. And I think the first is that I think you'd find a hard time finding any asset manager in North America or Europe, certainly, who would agree with the statement that integrating ESG factors generates lower returns. And we have certainly found that research shows the opposite. Companies with strong ESG-related practices have produced lower risks, lower cost of capital, better operational performance, and better share price performance over the long term. And then secondly, as an asset manager, again, we look at material factors that may impact long-term risk-adjusted returns. 
the reason we look at ESG factors is because they are material to that objective. So this is something that we're already looking at and that we're already considering. And you just need to look, you know, it's not just ourselves, either, you know, CIBC or RBC here on the call. Um, but if you look at the UN principles for responsible investing that have been mentioned a few times, there are over 2,500 asset managers and owners who are signatories to that. ESG is something that asset managers and owners have certainly already identified as something that's important in their investment decision making. Now, in terms of what may change with respect to how investors approach ESG moving forward, I do think the depth and quality of the data analysis engagements that investment teams are having with companies is going to be enhanced. There's going to be more focus on this, deeper analysis, and more, um, more focused conversations, certainly with individual investors and through these collaborations. And I certainly think there is going to be an enhanced expectation that companies and senior management are informed and articulate on these issues. Again, I would absolutely echo Dan and his comments about the importance of governance and corporate governance and the ability of executives, boards to be able to speak to these issues and have a view in them will continue and just become more important moving forward. Thank you, Maya. Dan, anything to add? Uh, yeah, not much to add to that. I would just reiterate the point I made earlier in the presentation um, um, that uh, I think for companies who get ESG right, there's an opportunity for multiple expansion and appreciation in their stock prices. So, I, you know, Maya made the point about uh, about higher medium term returns for investing properly in ESG, but there's even, you know, shorter term benefits from that directly in the share price if, if you get it right and can demonstrate to investors that you're getting it right. With respect to the second part of your question, you asked about, um, uh, I think you asked about uh, uh, shorter term uh, investment timelines. I think, you know, hedge funds will be faster money, will be longer term investors. I don't think sustainable investing necessarily changes any of that. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question regarding life cycle analysis and what are the emerging trends in this area? Um, this might be for Sean and, and Charles in connection with how the guide considers project life cycle. Um, Sean, do you want to start? Yes, thank you. Um, so the guide is intended to be applied across the entire mining life cycle. So at, from the pre-feasibility to closure. And the guide does talk about the level of information that is required changing uh, over that mine life cycle. So at a pre-feasibility stage, you may have um, less granular, less detailed climate information and uh, have more uncertainty in terms of the, the climate uh, adaptation measures, but they have to be considered at that stage. In design and in operation, you are going to very need very much granular information in order to use that information as part of the design and to establish these thres thresholds and uh, triggers. And then at closure, you know, best practice is to consider closure at the outset of the mine and work on closure continually. But the climate issues around closure are much uh, uh, greater highlighted in that you know, closure is going to last a long time and you want to not have an active, um, uh, as active a management uh, uh, process during closure. So you want to make sure the structures that you're, you're um, uh, leaving in place resemble the natural environment and are going to be resilient to changes over a much longer uh, period of time. So the guidance speaks to all of those phases and uh, it's making sure you're uh, applying the guidance appropriately at the appropriate stage. Thank you, Sean. Charles, anything to add? I think the one, the one thing to add to Sean, Sean's response is the, the idea that um, although it, it's kind of easy to sort of think about how you would apply this for a new facility, it is designed so that you can insert yourself into the kind of process that's described at, at any phase in the life cycle. You could even begin to apply this guidance uh, to a facility that's already been closed for many years even you know, in the context of governments or facilities that have reverted to the crown and the crown has control, um, they could equally be applying this, this guidance to some of those abandoned and orphan sites that have been um, 
exist in existence for, for many decades. So it's, it's designed to be flexible in that sense so that you, you don't just have to start at the beginning of the life cycle. It doesn't matter where you are, you can begin to apl apply this approach. Thank you, Charles. Um, another question um, from uh, participants, and this is for Maya and Dan. From an investment analysis perspective, is there a bigger weighting on a company reducing greenhouse gas emissions or on the company managing physical climate change risks? Maya, do you want to start? Yeah, I can start with that. So certainly when looking at a company, we're looking at both those aspects. So how is a company managing GHG emissions, air quality, water? We look at a whole range of different issues. And that includes the, their approach on climate adaptation as well. We don't weight them per se in terms of this matters more than that. We do look at materiality at a sector level. So across different sectors, different aspects of climate physical or climate risks or transition climate risk, we do identify those as being more material or less material to a particular sector. What I will say though about GHG emissions in terms of data availability and quality, that is some of the more available data that we do have uh, for ourselves. And I think that um, may inadvertently put a greater weighting on that aspect because there is data available to be used in quantitative analysis where it's far more difficult to quantify the quality of climate adaptation, for example. And I think that's just part of the evolution that's happening in this space is that both the climate data, the analysis that investors are doing is continually expanding and evolving um, as we and will continue to do so over the coming years. Dan, did you want to add in to that? Uh, no, nothing to add to that. Same answer. Agreed. Great. Well, as we've run out of the allotted time, you'll now see a pop-up survey question on your screen. Um, we would be grateful if you could take a moment uh, to click on a response um, before we close. We'll just uh, take a moment to uh, give participants a chance to respond. Um, and uh, we'd like to thank again our panelists for all their uh, time, their insights, um, sharing their frameworks. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are looking forward to the publication of the guide. Um, and to everyone else, um, thank you very much for joining our session today. We hope you found the panel discussion insightful and informative. Thanks again all and keep well. Thank you, Manuela. Thank you, Thank for you very much. Thank you to the team for putting Bye this together. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure.